So after the reversal trial was over and we learned uh, that intensive lipid lowering was better than moderate lipid lowering, we wanted to understand the factors responsible for the better outcome in patients that were treated more intensively. This slide shows, as published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2005, the relationship between change in LDL and disease progression for both treatment groups combined. And you see a very linear, strong relationship such that the lower LDL was, was, was reduced, the more it was reduced, the lower the progression rate. That made sense to us. That was the, what we were really intending to study. But then we got a surprise. As shown in this graphic, it mattered how LDL was lowered. It turned out that the moderate treatment group that received uh, pravastatin 40 milligrams and the high dose treatment group that received torvastatin 80 milligrams had different rates of progression even at the same degree of reduction in LDL cholesterol. That meant that it wasn't all about LDL. LDL did not predict entirely who would benefit and who wouldn't. So we looked for another factor and we ultimately found it uh, as shown here in this slide. The moderate treatment group had a 5.2% reduction in C-reactive protein, a measure of inflammation. The intensive treatment group had a 36.4% reduction in C-reactive protein. And so the question was, could this explain why the groups did differently despite some of the patients actually getting similar LDL reduction? And in fact, it did. And here's the graph that shows it. You can see the relationship here between change in CRP and atherosclerosis progression such that the more CRP was reduced, the more anti-inflammatory effect of the statin, the lower the progression rate. Very clear relationship, highly significant, even when adjusted for on-treatment LDL. And so you will see then in this bar chart that the people that had the lowest progression are people in whom both LDL and CRP were reduced. And so we hypothesized, based upon this finding, these findings, that statins are working by two mechanisms. They're lowering CRP and they're lowering LDL, and that both, both phenomena are in fact responsible for the improvement. And importantly, there was no correlation, as shown in this slide, between the degree of LDL reduction and the degree of reduction in C-reactive protein. Simply stated, these are two independent effects of statins that slow atherosclerosis progression, and they are not internally correlated. They're two different pathways. Well, of course, atherosclerosis is not only about LDL. And we knew at the time, and, and many people had published data suggesting that the effect uh, of HDL levels on disease, on the disease activity, on morbidity and mortality in epidemiological studies had been well demonstrated. And as you probably know, HDL is a lipoprotein. The protein associated with HDL is known as ApoA1. There are other proteins involved, but ApoA1 is the most important. And so we had an opportunity to perform an unusual experiment. It turns out that there are 40 people in the small Italian village of Limon Solgarda that have a variant of ApoA1 known as ApoA1 Milano. The carriers of this genetic polymorphism uh, have a mean HDL level of 17 milligrams per deciliter. You would expect them to develop premature coronary disease based upon a low HDL level, but they have no normal longevity and no atherosclerosis. It turns out there's a single amino acid substitution, a cysteine in place of an arginine, at position 173 in the molecule. 
Well, a small company who was able to make recombinantly this protein and to combine it with a phospholipid to make a synthetic HDL. P.K. Shaw uh, at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles infused this synthetic HDL into animals, in this case ApoE mice, and showed that he could regress their atherosclerosis in hours to days, not months or years. Very exciting, although many people were rather doubtful of whether this would work in humans. Well, we did, we did in fact test it. And about 10 years ago, uh, we conducted this study. Uh, we ultimately screened 123 patients, randomized uh, uh, about 50 into either placebo, low dose of this synthetic HDL, or high doses of the synthetic HDL, and then completed 47 of those patients uh, at the end of just six weeks. They got five infusions, just five infusions of this synthetic HDL at one week intervals, and then at week six, they got a second intravascular ultrasound study performed. We had very low expectations for the likelihood that we would see anything in a five-week, six-week study of atherosclerosis. You know, just it's a chronic disease. It took decades to get there. We didn't expect that these patients would show any benefit, but they did. And here you see that uh, nothing happened in the placebo group shown in blue, uh, but the low dose shown in orange, the high dose shown in gray, and the combined shown in yellow showed unequivocal, highly statistically significant regression of coronary atherosclerosis with only six weeks of treatment. It was shocking. Uh, it got an undue amount of media attention at the time, even though it was only a 47-patient study. We really considered it a pilot study, but you know, the desperation of patients for treatment means that sometimes things like this get overplayed. Uh, this is uh, from Time Magazine, and it shows you the, uh, a picture of some of these individuals from uh, the little village of Limon Silgarda. And Time Magazine referred to this as Drano for the heart, which, of course, as a physician scientist, no one wants their, uh, their scientific work to be uh, brought down to that level. But hey, it's just how these things get communicated. So, so we studied liquid Drano for the heart, and it actually worked. Now, of course, Nothing escapes the, uh, the watchful eye of the federal government. And some uh, weeks after uh, we published this, I got a call from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration from NASA. And they asked me to make an urgent trip down to the Johnson Space Center in, in Houston uh, for urgent government business. And being a true patriotic citizen, I said yes, and I flew down there. And this is a picture of me in mission control at NASA um, shortly after we published this study um, because they wanted, they wanted to know if we could give them some of this stuff to put on the International Space Station in case any of the astronauts develop coronary disease. <laughs> and I had to explain to them that there was no way to do that, uh, but it was an interesting and certainly an informative trip. So uh, uh, it's not on the space station yet and it's not even in the clinics yet, but it was a very important pilot study. With intravascular ultrasound, we went on to study other phenomena. And this uh, slide shows the schematic for a hypertension study. We'd already shown that lower was better for LDL. We wanted to ask the same question about blood pressure reduction. And so you see that in this study, uh, we randomized 2,000 patients into an outcome trial, did intravascular ultrasound in a little more than 400 of those, treated them for 24 months with blood pressure lowering medications, placebo, enalapril, an ACE inhibitor, or amlodipine, a calcium channel blocker. In fact, these patients had relatively normal blood pressures. The placebo group shown at the top is, has blood pressures of around 130 millimeters of mercury systolic. We lowered that by about five millimeters of mercury with either enalapril or amlodipine. You know, a reasonable difference that took them down to about 124 or 125. 
And the question is, what would happen? Well, uh, strikingly, uh, in those patients, particularly those that had above the mean in blood pressure, there was a reduction in morbidity and mortality, a very wide array of adverse cardiovascular endpoints are reduced, a little bit more so with amlodipine than in allopril. And in parallel, there was a reduction in the rate of progression of disease. The placebo patients all progressed. In fact, the enalapril and amlodipine patients did not progress. And so we concluded, in fact, that blood pressure reduction also slows the progression of coronary atherosclerosis using intravascular ultrasound as the means to detect the rate of change of plaque in the coronaries. So here we were, you know, now, this is now about seven or eight years ago, and it shows you a number of studies that we had performed uh, to date looking at the relationship between LDL cholesterol on the horizontal axis and the change in atherosclerosis progression shown on the vertical axis. You will notice that in all of these studies, there is some progression. None of them are actually showing regression, but they all, they all line up along a line of regression. And so the area shown by the dotted line is an unexplored region. Nobody had gone to very low levels of LDL cholesterol. And so we wanted to go where no man has gone before into that range of very low LDL levels. And to do so, we needed a more powerful approach. And at this point in time, a new statin had just been introduced that was even more powerful, resuvastatin. And so we took a group of patients with a mean baseline LDL of 130 milligrams per deciliter. We reduced them to 60. That was a 53% reduction in LDL cholesterol, one of the largest reductions ever achieved in a clinical trial to date. And the question was, and we also were able, by the way, to increase their HDL with this statin, which is a a little bit more effective at raising HDL than some of the other statins. What would happen at an LDL not of 79 as we had in reversal, but an LDL of 60? Well, the, there was good news. In this slide, we show you both primary endpoints, which was the percent change in atheromal volume and the change in the most disease segment, and both showed unequivocal highly statistically significant regression. And so we learned from this study that if you get LDL low enough, you don't just slow the progression of disease, you actually can in fact regress it. But it takes very intensive lowering of LDL to much lower levels than, we're, than our customer really achieved in most patients. Here's a, uh, a histogram showing you the distribution of progressors and regressors. In orange, you see that about 64% of patients regressed, and in blue, about 36% of patients progressed. What that meant was that if we got LDLs down to 60, we could regress approximately two-thirds of the patients with coronary disease. We thought that was an important finding that suggested that, in fact, lower is better. I can now place this trial, the asteroid study, on a uh, graph along with the rest of the studies. And you see here that as LDL is pushed down into that range around 70, you start to go into negative territory. And by the time you get to an LDL of 60, you have unequivocal regression. There is a very close relationship between LDL on treatment and the ability to regress the disease. My colleague, Dr. Steve Nichols, shown in this slide, published in JAMA in 2007, a regression plot showing all of our studies, now involving more than 4,000 patients. And you see an amazingly linear relationship between on-treatment LDL 
and the rate of progression of disease. In fact, at an LDL of about 65, that line crosses zero, gets into negative territory, and by the time you get to LDLs below 60, you have very significant unequivocal regression. It's a very striking, consistent relationship. Dr. Nichols also published from our database the relation between HDL increases and the plaque progression, and it's exactly the opposite. You see that as HDL is increased, there is progressively less disease progression, and if you get enough HDL increase, you see some disease regression. A very striking phenomenon. Let me then pause there.